Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Vessalatu vesselamu ala seyyidina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I would like to welcome you to class number one out of 12 classes for ITKI 6203 Islam and Family. This is the summer 2023 trimester, June through August 2023, for IKI Academy, the Institute of Knowledge Integration. And I am your teacher, Dr. Omar Al Talib, for this course. It is my honor and my pleasure to welcome you all and to have a great discussion and a great learning experience, God willing, so that we can all benefit from knowing more about Islam and family institutions. I welcome you all to ask questions and to share all your comments, criticisms, thoughts, concerns, and ideas in this class, uh, both verbally and in the comment section and as well as through our Telegram group. Since we will be meeting for three months during our 12 class sessions, I will be arranging the topics throughout the trimester. And also, I want to make you aware of the way in which this class will be graded, the assessments for this course. And they are based upon four assignments attendance, and a short research paper. Each assignment is worth 10% of your grade. Attendance is worth 10% of your grade. And the short research paper is worth 10% of your grade. So uh, the total will be 40% based upon your four assignments, 10% based upon your attendance, and 50% for your research paper. Welcome, Sodat. Uh, good to see you in class. May Allah bless you. I mean, thank you, sir. Uh, I encourage all our students to please come and join the class. Uh, and also, I want everybody to know that we are recording the class and it will be available on my YouTube page, which I have put the link in the Telegram group. Also, I encourage everybody to make use of the learning management system, the LMS, called Classy 365 for IKI Academy. If you have any trouble or issues with any of the technical aspects of the class or other matters, please contact me and the IKI administration. We are here to share knowledge. And knowledge, according to the Muslim perspective, has two main sources. The primary source of knowledge is called revealed knowledge, which comes from the Creator, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also we have another source of knowledge, which is human knowledge, which is using our God-given capacity to reason, to understand, to make sense of the world, using our intelligence, using our intellect, uh, and that knowledge which we derive from the world around us, we are referring to as human knowledge. Using both revelation and also human knowledge, we can understand this world and know what is necessary to have the best of lives. Since we are dealing with the field of knowledge uh, that is involving the family. Normally, uh, the family is studied scientifically by scholars, and the family is considered a subject of study for the social sciences. So humanity has divided the sciences into different branches, into uh, different types. Welcome, Brother Enes. Good to see you in class. May Allah bless you. Uh, so humanity has divided sciences in different ways. 
And one of the ways the sciences have been divided, and this is not the only way to do it, uh, and it was not done in every civilization in the same way, but in the modern civilization that we are dealing with, knowledge has been divided into natural sciences and social sciences. So it is science that is derived using the abilities that have been made available by our creator uh, to humanity. The natural sciences deal with the, quote unquote, the natural world, the physical objects, uh, the uh, planets, the stars, the uh, geology of the earth, uh, nature, uh, anything you can touch, smell, uh, hear, see, that is made part or studied as part of the natural sciences. Uh, it is put under the natural world. Then there is something called the social sciences. The social sciences deal with the behavior of human beings. Uh, so we have the science of history, political science, economics, sociology, psychology, anthropology. If it deals with money, then uh, that is normally what is studied under economics by scientists who are called economists. So whether it is, uh, for example, studying banks or uh, currency or the stock market, or now we have something called cryptocurrency or the uh, buying and selling uh, of goods and services, all those things dealing with money are normally studied by economists uh, in a field under a field called economics. If it is dealing with power, then there is a field called political science. So if uh, we are studying the government, if we are looking at wars, if we are looking at conflict uh, between uh, political entities, if we are looking at the borders of countries, if we are looking at citizenship, uh, if we are looking at voting and deciding who will be uh, in power, if we are looking at dictatorships, if we are looking at democracy, uh, that is what is referred to as political scientists. And it is studied, uh, it is referred to as political science, excuse me, and it is studied by political scientists. Then we have a field called psychology. Psychology is a field of science which involves studying what is inside our brain. So whatever is taking place uh, inside the brain that ends up affecting human behavior, uh, this is studied under a field called psychology. It overlaps with another field from medicine called psychiatry. Psychiatry deals more with the uh, <clears throat> medicine aspect uh, and with the uh, physical changes inside the brain, psychology deals more with the mental issues, uh, with thinking. Uh, and I am not teaching uh, psychology, uh, although it is an important uh, course here at IKI Academy. But for example, if you look at the Sufi tradition uh, and the idea of how to improve our uh, mental state, our mental situation, uh, our self, our soul, uh, our thinking, our moods, controlling our desires, uh, being able to uh, have uh, fulfillment uh, and being uh, in a position uh, to uh, go outside of our body uh, and to have a greater spiritual connection with our Creator. This has been uh, studied and documented under the field called psychology. Now, everything human beings do is affected by every person's psychology, but psychology is a separate field uh, than uh, the other uh, human sciences, than the other social sciences, due to its importance and due to the methods for studying the mind are uh, very complex uh, and are different than looking at uh, economic issues, political issues, and uh, social issues. Uh, there is another field in uh, the social sciences called anthropology, uh, and there is a course uh, at IKI Academy called Anthropology of Islam. 
this deals with the societies that are still developing uh, or that the European or Western countries uh, considered primitive, although we do not use that word, we use the term uh, still under uh, the uh, development stages. Normally it is small groups or tribes or societies in the jungle or in the desert, such as the Arab tribes normally uh, are studied by the uh, people uh, who are specialized in uh, anthropology uh, as uh, a field. Uh, I am sorry to Sister uh, Mohinatu who is having trouble uh, joining. Uh, if anybody can help her, uh, then hopefully uh, that uh, will be addressed. Let me just send her a message. I'll try to help you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> there is a, a field called history, which essentially covers all the other social sciences. So it is taking everything we study in the social sciences, but looking at the past. So if we are looking at the present and the future, then we would study political science, economics, sociology, uh, psychology, anthropology. But if we are looking at the past, then we call that field history. So it covers all the social science fields in the past. And in order to understand the present, it is incredibly important to know what happened in the past. Uh, so, for example, if we look at clothes, all of us wear clothes. We wear different kinds of clothes. We wear different uh, fabrics of clothes. We wear different colors of clothes. We wear different shapes of clothes. We cover different uh, parts of our body or uncover different parts of our body uh, with clothes. Uh, so. To understand why we wear what we wear today, uh, it is important to understand what we wore uh, hundreds or thousands of years ago. Uh, so, for example, uh, many Muslim men today might wear a shirt, uh, but in the past, uh, many Muslim men might be wearing a thob or dishdasha or, or long gown, which today would be called a dress, which is something that is associated with women. So if you look at the Arab tribes and African tribes uh, and many tribes in Asia, what they are wearing, uh, or at least what they wore in the past, is what today uh, a woman would wear. Uh, so if a woman wears it, it's called a dress. If, it, if a man wears it, uh, it's called whatever it is referred to in the local language, such as in Arabic, we use the term thob or dishdasha. Uh, you can let me know in the comments what in your societies would be called uh, the long uh, white or black uh, dress that is worn by men, uh, especially in different cultures and different societies. Uh, and also, if you look, for example, at head covering, uh, many people in the West, in Europe, in modern societies, do not cover their heads, unless for, uh, probably in the military or the police. But in the past, and in many Muslim societies today, men cover their heads with different things. It could be with the uh, uh, with the arachin, with the kopi, with the kafiya. It could be with the hat, like many people in Africa and Southeast Asia wear. Uh, it could be with the turban, uh, like you see people in uh, Mali or in Sudan uh, wearing. Uh, now it is more associated with religious scholars in some societies uh, like Egypt. Uh, so men covered their hair in many Muslim societies. Now when a woman covers her hair, we say, uh, yes, uh, Saudat, please join. Uh, uh, let us know what you have to say. If you can unmute and let us know you have a comment or a question, Soda. Oh, it removed it. Okay. So when a woman covers her hair, we call that a hijab or scarf or many other uh, words. When a man covers his hair, then we refer to it using other terms. 
uh, such as uh, Turban or uh, uh, Utra in uh, the uh, Arab Gulf countries uh, or uh, Kafia in places like Palestine. Uh, and in Africa, many uh, Muslim men, they uh, cover their hair uh, in different ways. So in different societies, different genders, men and women, may or may not cover their hair. And when they do cover their hair, it is using different types of cloths, different types of covers, uh, different uh, types of designs and styles. Uh, but to understand what people wear or do not wear today, we have to look at what happened in the past. So when we talk about a field called sociology, which is a social science, which is how we will study Islam and the family. Yes, uh, Dupi Salah in Central Asia. Thank you, uh, Sanja, for, for sharing that. Absolutely. Uh, the men wore that. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Uh, so <clears throat> in the field of sociology, we look at what human beings do. But we're not looking at the power or the money that deals, that's political science and economics. We're not looking at what is inside a person's head. That is psychology. In sociology, we study everything else that has to do with human behavior, where the behavior of one person is affecting the behavior of other people. So we look at things like the family, which is what this uh, course is focusing on. Uh, we look at uh, religious institutions, such as the masjid, or the church, or the uh, Jewish temple, or the Hindu temple, or other religious structures. Uh, and we look at school, education, uh, universities, uh, katatib, which is where Quran was taught uh, in Muslim societies and continues to be taught in many Muslim societies. So in sociology, we study everything that humans do that has to do with interaction between humans, but that is not mostly focused on uh, economics or political science. So if it is a government, that is political science. If it is uh, a company or a bank, that is uh, economics. If it is a family, which is not uh, designed to uh, focus only on money or only on power. If it is a masjid, which is not designed for money or power. If it is a school, which is not designed for money or power. So this becomes part of the sociology. Uh, now, there's a lot of overlap. Every social science overlaps with the other because human beings do all kinds of things and everything is affecting everything else. Power and money and our uh, psychological mood and our families and our religion and our education, all that is affecting everything else. In or but in order to study it, we divide it up into different fields. And these fields are artificial. They're human made. They're not something that came from Allah, from our creator. Uh, there's some, it's, it's something that humans, we humans, came up with so that we can understand the world around us, the people around us, the behavior around us. So anything I share with you in this class is not revelation. It is uh, human knowledge. So it can be correct, it can be incorrect, uh, it can be a mixture of falsehood and uh, uh, correct things. Uh, sometimes there are things that are uh, considered uh, problematic. Sometimes there are things that are considered uh, agreed upon and, uh, and positive and helpful. All that is part of the human science that we are dealing with uh, in this class. So that's why uh, Muslim scholars throughout history uh, and I'm one of them, we begin by saying we do not have sole access to the truth. And what we are sharing with you is our limited interpretation and understanding. It can be true, it can be not true. The only thing that is 100% true that we believe in as Muslims is revelation from our creator, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, it is something that is part of human knowledge, human understanding, which will always be limited and which will always be prone to either being correct or incorrect uh, throughout our discussions. Uh, and so please feel free to uh, give your opinions, to give your ideas, to give your thoughts. Uh, this class is not about 
uh, proving anybody right or wrong, but it is about sharing knowledge and understanding uh, and our experiences. Any questions uh, or thoughts so far? Everything is clear? Good. Uh, now, I also have to uh, uh, share with you uh, my own limitations and my own uh, background because it affects what I say and uh, what I think. Uh, and so I am originally from a country called Iraq, from a city called Mosul in the northern part uh, of Iraq. Uh, and I also am uh, somebody who is part of a family that immigrated to the United States of America. So I am an American. Uh, and I grew up and studied in uh, the United States, uh, which has also affected my background, my thinking, my understanding, uh, my language, uh, and my interests. Uh, so <clears throat> as an Iraqi, I can relate to the Eastern culture, to the uh, Arabic culture, to the Middle Eastern culture. As an American, I can relate to the European culture, to the Western culture, to the North American culture. And no culture is perfect. Both have positive things uh, and negative things. And so one of the challenges in our world today, what we call the modern world, is to try to understand and choose from our cultures uh, and our societies what is best for us and try to avoid what is hurtful and what is problematic. And so this is one of the things we will, some of the things we will discuss in the family class, the developments in uh, the world around us, which is helpful, which is hurtful, how can we uh, best navigate this, whether it is the use of uh, cell phones uh, in modern society, especially when it comes to our kids, whether it is the issue of identity uh, and uh, connection to uh, one culture or another culture, whether it has to do with uh, bilingualism, trilingualism, uh, whether it has to do with uh, the issues surrounding uh, the uh, <clears throat> gay and lesbian community, whether it is the issues surrounding male-female relationships, the roles of wives, the roles of husbands, uh, the roles of family members. There are all kinds of things going on in our lives uh, that can enhance our relationship with the Creator bring us closer to Allah, make our lives more positive, and there are things that will do the opposite. And it is very hard for everybody, uh, especially in various parts of the world, to make sure that their lives are as uh, positive and productive uh, as possible. Uh, any questions or uh, reactions to our understanding of the social sciences? of sociology, of our study of the family, okay? So what we are doing is called science. And when I say science, what I mean is systematic, methodical study of what we are observing around us. If it is science, it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It just means we are using our best knowledge and understanding and tools that our Creator has given us to understand what is around us. It is not perfect and it is not uh, revelation, but it is necessary and important. And it is a command from our creator in the Quran to understand, to contemplate, to look at what is around us and to try to achieve. Uh, there are two very important uh, principles in Islam and uh, you uh, probably already know them. Itqan and Ihsan. Let me write it down here in the comment section. Okay. We have Itqan and we have Ihsan. Right? Uh, Itqan is perfection. Uh, Ihsan is improvement. So our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and our guide, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, taught us that we are not perfect, but we should always seek perfection. And we are also taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through the example of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him as Muslims to achieve improvement, to try to make things better, to make our lives better, to make our families better, to make our neighborhood better, to make our society better, to find what is good around us and preserve it and improvement 
and to look at what is uh, not as uh, positive around us and to try to change it for the better, to try to take what is negative and make it positive, to try to take what is destructive and to make it productive. Inshallah, we will work together to try to uh, be uh, able to fulfill our duties uh, in terms of itqan and ihsan in everything, inshallah. And I am here to help you in that process. And you can also help me because we all need uh, the support of each other. Now, I also emphasize history because most of us, including myself, were never taught history very well. Even if we took some history classes in school, it is usually from a very limited perspective, a very uh, problematic perspective, uh, and uh, a perspective that uh, is not very uh, fulfilling. Uh, and uh, let me give you just uh, a three-minute uh, break here. Uh, I will come back in uh, three minutes, uh, and I will let you think about uh, some of the things uh, that you have learned from history that you later found out is uh, problematic or questionable or incorrect or not very uh, helpful. So let's just take three minutes and I will be right back. <laughs> Okay, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuhu. Let's see. Muhinatu wants to join the call. Okay. Hopefully, Muhinatu can join us. Very good. So, if I could ask you, uh, Brother Anas, uh, any thoughts about uh, history or study of history? What uh, you have been taught?
You can hear us, uh, Ennis? Connection is not very good, Brother Ennis. Maybe if you uh, exit and then come back in, the connection may be better. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Brother Sanjar, uh, thoughts about uh, history? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Nice to see you again, Dr. Omar. And uh, yes, uh, the history in, in Uzbekistan, especially, is very politicized. And it, uh, we are taught about only the, uh, the chronicle, uh, the dates, periods of the dynasties. We know the dynasties, but we don't know uh, the other aspect of our culture or civilization, uh, which is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, exists in Central Asia. And one historian uh, criticized this uh this policy because uh we should abandon this uh uh, uh the teaching history uh, based on uh learning uh, di dynasties politics states but we should focus on the uh, other aspects uh for example the civilizational uh the history based on civilization in central asia it's a better way to understand uh, other cultures and our uh, civilization, cultural development, because you know uh, the Central Asia is uh, uh, is located uh, in uh, crossroads of different civilizations: it's nomad, nomadic, sedentary, Russian, uh, Chinese, the, the Indian, uh, and also Buddha uh, and Islamic, uh, shamanic. You know, shaman. Uh, I don't know how to say this. Uh, such uh, civilizations influ influenced uh, on uh, the culture of Central Asians, especially Uzbekistan's, uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, I, I am Uzbek from Uzbekistan, and uh, we have different uh, elements of different uh, civilizations and cultures. Nowadays, we have this in rural areas. Uh, this most uh, uh, kept these elements kept, but in in uh, cities, uh, you know, is a modern life. They uh, abandon the traditional lifestyle, and they prefer le uh, they are leading the modern lifestyle. So I don't know, but when it comes to history, we should uh, still learn the civilizational development of of, of our uh the region or uh, the uh, country thank you very much thank you uh brother sanja uh so that uh, what would you like to share about history with a little of my knowledge about history. History <laughs> makes, makes us know what, are, what it has been in the past. Because in the because of history, how we know what happened in the life history of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and others. Come down to the generation, our forefather, our grandpa. I as a person, I did not meet my grandpa now. Because of his, uh, because of the history, I know very much about him. So, with this now, I believe history makes us better in in the lifestyle. So that's the least I can say for now. Stop the stop now. Thank you, thank you so much, Sibodet. May Allah bless you. Uh, Anes, uh, can we try again? Uh, see, uh, go ahead. Brother Anas? Uh, in, 
Uh, I think the connection is still uh, a problem. Uh, sorry about that, uh, unless uh, it's cutting off and, and not very clear. Inshallah, your connection can be uh, improved. Uh, Sanjay, you, you wanted to mention? Yes, yes. You know, uh, in our history, there is a very uh, weird thing about uh, uh, coming, uh, Islam, coming of Islam to the Central Asia. Uh, historians uh, uh, say that the Arabs conquered our country, and our ulama, ulama, the Islamic ulama, I, I think Islamic scholars, support this idea because before uh, uh, Muslims that time should offer uh, a sulh, or they should uh, 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 introduce the Islam to the rulers of other countries. If they don't accept this, then they, uh, the Arabs should or must uh, uh, declare a war against these countries. But the Arabs came without offering this, without surah, and conquered. Qutayba ibn Muslim. Qutayba ibn Muslim conquered the first of uh, the Central Asia. So this is a very interesting thing. I think that... Uh, uh, what to say? Uh, after this, we say uh, we are Muslim because of these uh, people, and we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, what uh, side uh, make make this personality sign declare this personality personality sign declare before this uh, 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 call it enemy or it uh, they were our enemy after Islamization of Central Asia. They became uh, the whole say science, Islamic science. This is the worst thing in, in our history. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjar, uh, for sharing that. So uh, I want to emphasize here that uh, everything is interconnected and everything has a history. Everybody has a history, every family has a history. Every neighborhood has a history, every tribe has a history, every society has a history. And in order for us to achieve what I referred to earlier called Iqam and Ihsan, excellence and improvement, we have to know many things and that includes history. Otherwise, we will repeat the mistakes of the past. And that is why the Quran has so much history. Maybe one third of the Quran is about history. Uh, it is uh, important to learn from the Quran the lessons of that history. So the Quran is mentioning the history of many people and uh, many tribes, uh, not to waste our time or to uh, emphasize only bad things about one group of people or another, but to help us understand what was done and make something that is better. So the Quran talks a lot about, uh, for example, ancient Egypt, uh, the uh, Pharaoh, Pharaon, uh, and uh, some of the rich people in ancient Egypt, like uh, uh, Harun, Qarun. Uh, and so <clears throat> uh, what is the lesson that we can learn? Uh, one lesson that we learn is if you want power and all you seek is power, Power will destroy you, or you will be destroyed if all you care about is power, gaining power, controlling other people's lives. Uh, so uh, part of that lesson is dictatorship is haram, and uh, bay'ah, choice, democracy, choosing, electing, uh, however you want to call it, is uh, not just halal, but uh, a requirement for societies. Uh, we can learn... <clears throat> from also the uh, great lessons in the Quran about the Israeli tribes, about the Jewish tribes, and the difficulties they had in keeping alive uh, the religion, the teachings of Judaism, uh, the revelations of Allah regarding the Jewish faith, uh, the uh, <coughs> teachings of Allah through Ibrahim, 
through uh, Nabi Musa, through uh, Nabi Dawood, through Nabi Sulaiman, all of whom are, uh, are Jewish prophets and belong to Jewish tribes that uh, were frequently uh, being uh, treated badly or given uh, misleading ideas by uh, the uh, people around them and the uh, tribes around them. So <clears throat> uh, every group of people goes through difficulties and the Quran talks about this but chooses only certain people. Quran cannot talk about every group and every tribe in history so it chooses certain people, certain tribes such as the Israeli tribes and looks at the difficulties and the challenges they faced and how they were able to overcome some or many or all of these challenges. So Nabi Musa alayhi salam, for example, was not a good speaker. Uh, so uh, he chose Harun, uh, his brother, uh, to uh, be with him when he did da'wah, when he tried to spread uh, the message of Allah uh, and to uh, share his uh, ideas that were revealed to him by Allah about freedom and about uh, worshiping one God and about getting rid of uh, dictatorship. So uh, Harun, his brother, uh, helped him out. Uh, and so on the one hand, you have Fir'aun and Qarun, money and power. And on the other hand, you have Musa and Harun, love and peace and dignity and respect and the uh, belief in a creator who gave all of us equal rights, who did not make any people better than other people, who did not make pe white people better than black people, who did not make uh, Asian people better than uh, American people, who did not make anybody better than everybody else. In the eyes of Allah, everybody is the same, regardless of language and heritage and culture, uh, and religion and so this is what we call in Islam the basis of anti-racism how we are supposed to be against racism the reality unfortunately though both among Muslims and non-Muslims is we have a lot of racism in our age today and this racism unfortunately is spread by families, it is spread by the school, it is spread by, it's spread in many masjids, uh, unfortunately, by many imams. And so we have some wonderful imams and wonderful mosques that spread uh, respect and dignity uh, and tolerance uh, and uh, unity of Allah. But unfortunately, we do also have some imams, some masjids that spread racism and hatred and looking down on other people which again, from my perspective and the IKI Academy perspective is unacceptable. Any type of racism is unacceptable. Any type of sexism is unacceptable, saying that men are better than women or women are better than men. Any type of uh, linguistic uh, superiority, saying one language is better than another or that uh, one language is acceptable by Allah and all the other languages are rejected. We don't have this idea. Every human being in every language can worship Allah uh, and uh, achieve uh, the greatest goal of entering into al firdos into heaven, regardless of the language they speak uh, and their ethnic uh, background and their racial background and their color and their family. All of us will be judged by Allah according to the same standards, the same criteria. In addition uh, to those aspects of history, we notice that uh, in the Quran and in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, we have a lot of guidance uh, with regard to our activities and our actions and our support for each other. So for example, there's a long history of art uh, and painting and sculpture uh, and uh, <coughs> singing and dancing and music in Islamic history, Islamic culture. But unfortunately, many Muslims today, whether they might be Wahhabi or Salafi or uh, some of the uh, more uh, <coughs> radical uh, Muslim uh, believers, they would say that singing and dancing and music is haram. Uh, 
which is completely against uh, Islamic history, which is against the Quran, which is against the Sunnah. Nothing in the Quran makes dancing or singing or uh, music haram. Uh, this came later. Now, of course, if, if there are uh, haram things being done uh, in dancing, for example, unrelated, uh, unmarried men and women who shouldn't be touching each other or uh, dancing with each other, the un, uh, unacceptable uh, contact, that is haram, not, not the dancing itself. Same thing with music. Uh, music is a blessing from Allah made by instruments uh, created by uh, human beings. Uh, in order to entertain. Uh, and so if you uh, want to become better, then you can listen to music, uh, singing. What is a song? Song is poetry. It is words that are said in a nice way. Now, if there are bad words, it doesn't mean that uh, singing is haram. It means bad words are haram. We should never promote uh, uh, incorrect uh, behavior, bad behavior, negative behavior, uh, un-Islamic behavior, whether it is in a song or in a speech or in a book or anything else. So uh, saying bad things, using bad words, that is haram. But singing uh, it, by itself is not haram. It's like going to the mall. Uh, is going shopping haram? Of course not. But if you are going to buy a... Uh, <clears throat> something to hurt people, or if you are going to buy uh, illegal drugs, or if you are going to uh, buy uh, some uh, bad magazines, the buying of the bad thing is what is haram, not going to the market uh, and buying and selling. So we apply this principle to the family. When we teach our kids, we have to help them understand the distinction between our activities and behaviors and how to make it pure and acceptable to our Creator, and how to avoid uh, any part of our behavior uh, that involves something that is not acceptable in the religion. And in order to better do this, we uh, can look at history, Islamic civilization, how Muslims developed, how Muslims became the strongest uh, and most prosperous and most powerful and most enlightened people on earth. It was not through making uh, what is halal haram. It was through enlightenment and progress uh, and itqan and ihsan uh, and raising human activity uh, to the highest levels, the highest levels of uh, the best songs, the best dances, the best music, the best paintings, the calligraphy, uh, the uh, mosque uh, designs uh, and whether it is through sculpture, whether it is through uh, <coughs> uh, buildings, uh, whether it's through gardens. Muslims made the nicest gardens on earth. Uh, and you see this in uh, uh, Muslim civilization in Africa. You see this in Muslim civilization in Asia. You see this in Muslim civilization in Europe. Uh, so Muslim civilization around the world was able to take uh, what they learned from all the other civilizations and practice itqan and ihsan, improvement and excellence, uh, and build on what uh, is uh, available and make it better uh, and stronger and purer uh, and nicer and more beneficial. So you look at preserving the environment. Muslims were the best at preserving the environment uh, or just as good as other civilizations that respected the environment. And later on, unfortunately, uh, many Europeans affected by the Catholic Church especially, they considered that uh, the environment is something that it is okay to destroy it because just making humans happy justifies uh, the destruction of uh, the environment in every way, shape and form, uh, and that is a true tragedy. Okay, any questions about uh, history at this point? Uh, yes, Sanjo. Uh, there was a, uh, the Jews, a Jew uh, historian or culture, I don't know, but his name was Yosha Yalon, uh, I don't you know this or not. He, when I uh, s uh, watched his lecture, he uh, said something very interesting. According to him, his 
uh, understanding of Islam, the history is only uh, uh, history of Islam, because Islam came to down in order to Islamize the whole world, and the uh, the uh, you know the orientation of the history or world is Islamic. Islam should back uh, the other and Islamic countries lands to the Islamic reign. It's not about the uh, establishing caliphate, but uh, establishing Islamic understanding the world, the nations, and the development and the uh, unity of humanity. You know, this is a very interesting uh, position. Uh, this uh, Moshe Elon, or I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't remember his name. So, you know, the, this is a very paradigmatic approach to the history from a viewpoint of Islam, because we understand. You said that the history uh, very, very, very well described in in in, in Quran. We know this. The Jewish history, the especially since the of Middle East, but other part of uh, uh, world uh, never mentioned in the Quran. We know this, but uh, from this point, uh, uh, very it is you know when we plan this, how to approach to the history. It's very interesting uh, from these uh, cultures. We are out of uh, Islamic reign. The Islamic, uh, they were uh, an Islamic countries. The another uh, approach to the history. I think very interesting. This. We should uh, understand about this because you are living in 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 in, uh, in the USA. Uh, you your kids learn just as a uh, history of US which begins uh, in 7th or uh, uh, no 17th or 18th century from from this time but the history of islam not begins with the prophet uh, muhammad wasalam. it begins with the uh, from the adam wasalam, the history of islam the very important thing to understand the history thank you very much May Allah bless you. Uh, yes, and to uh, elaborate on your very important points. Uh, and the reason that uh, I'm emphasizing history, there are many reasons, but one is in order for our children to be successful and to be uh, better able to understand this world, it is our job as parents, as elders, as leaders in the community, uh, as neighbors, uh, as relatives, to share as much history as possible with our children. In order for a child to know and understand the world around them, they need to understand their own civilization. Once a child understands their own civilization, then they compare it to other civilizations and build upon it. But if a child does not know their own civilization, then this will affect their identity negatively, uh, it will affect their understanding uh, of the world uh, in negative ways, and it will make them weaker uh, in terms of being able to uh, build uh, and renew civilization. Uh, so <clears throat> if we are Muslim, then we teach our children Islamic civilization. But most Muslims do not know about Islamic civilization. They may know some things here and there. Uh, and those things may be right or wrong. And this is a real uh, tragedy. Uh, so <clears throat> we have the history of humanity from Eve and Adam, alayhi uh, salam And then we have the history of the prophets. And we have the last prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, and then as humanity goes up and down and progresses uh, and regresses, uh, then you see uh, different uh, transformations. It is so important, as the Quran emphasized, to look at the transformation of society. When societies are becoming better and improving, uh, how do we understand that? And when society is 
uh, declining and destroying uh, itself or being destroyed? How do we understand that? And Muslims are not an exception. So Muslims are able and have been able to create a civilization and make it better and stronger. But also Muslims have faced the decline and destruction of their civilization. Now, whether you want to blame outside forces or inside forces or both, it matters that children learn about all the aspects, not just the good aspects, not just the bad aspects. Same thing with the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the companions of the Prophet. Some people teach their kids that the companions are perfect and never did anything wrong. This is a lie. We respect them as companions of the Prophet. We acknowledge uh, all the great things they have done for Islamic society and civilization. But they were definitely not perfect. Uh, they were not uh, angels. Uh, they were human beings who uh, uh, made some right decisions and made some mistakes. Uh, and so to try to uh, make uh, Abu Bakr or Omar or Uthman or Ali radiallahu anhum uh, into these uh, perfect uh, human beings who never did anything wrong is absolutely incorrect. But sometimes, unfortunately, our children are taught these kinds of misconceptions. And we also have to emphasize that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, went through a lot of challenges, a lot of difficulties. Uh, many things he faced are worse than anything we have ever faced in our own life. Uh, and so those are things we need to learn from, not just his victories and successes uh, and achievements, which are extremely important, but the whole thing. We have to give history uh, to our children the whole package, all the positives and negatives, both for our civilization and also for other civilizations. Because, for example, in order to understand the Quran, uh, it's not enough just to understand Islam. Uh, it's important to understand uh, Christianity and before that Judaism to better understand the Quran. Because a lot of concepts and ideas and verses in the Quran are dealing with Christianity and Judaism. So it's very important to understand those religions. Also, a lot of what is mentioned in, in the Quran has to do with paganism, <clears throat> with what we call uh, shirk and kufr, uh, association with Allah or uh, rejection of Allah, astaghfirullah. The societies that existed at the time of Muslims were different kinds of societies. Some of them were religious, like the Jews and Christians, and some of them were following other religions, uh, pagan religions, nativist religions, uh, and a variety of uh, other belief systems. Those we also need to understand and help our children understand so that they can understand the Quran and understand the uh, Islamic tradition. So you have some Muslims who are extremists who say it is haram to read the Bible, haram to read the Torah. Uh, and we have... Uh, some other Muslims at the other extreme who say, uh, no need to read all these religious texts, they're uh, unimportant or they uh, are not helpful in any way or they're all bad or they're all good. We need to have a balance, okay? First of all, it's not haram to read the Bible or the Torah. Second of all, it's not just uh, uh, halal to read it. It is encouraged and important to read it to understand uh, the Quran. So for example, <clears throat> We have in the Muslim tradition uh, the practice that uh, when uh, women are going through their period of the month through menstruation, they don't go to the masjid. Where did this come from? This idea came from Judaism. Because in Judaism, when a woman uh, does not uh, have the uh, child conceived, when her egg uh, is not fertilized by a sperm, and it is uh, <coughs> flushed out by the body, uh, during the uh, cycle. Uh, for Judaism, this is like a funeral. This is considered, or, or not all Judaism, but many parts of Judaism, uh, this is considered as a death. A, a, a potential human life uh, did not occur, so it dies and is flushed out by the system. So this is a period of uh, a funeral, of mourning for a woman. She is sad. She is 
uh, in a situation as if somebody died. And when you are mourning, when you are sad in the Jewish tradition, at least in the past in some uh, parts of the Jewish tradition, you don't go uh, and worship in the Jewish temple. And so there's a history uh, to these ideas, to the things that Muslims do. Now, Muslims don't do it necessarily in the exact same ways uh, or in the uh, exact uh, same uh, practice, but there is a history to every Muslim practice. There is a history to every social practice. There is a history to everything uh, that humans do. And a lot of things that don't make sense to us today will start to make sense if we understand their history. And I will add to that, since this is a family class, we need to understand our own family history. What do I mean? So all of us have parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. There are people who came before us that led to our existence according to the will of Allah, the will of our Creator. Now, who were these people? What are their names? How are we related to them? This is called family history. What did they do? Where did they live? What did they eat? What did they wear? What happened to them? Uh, was there a war? Was there uh, great uh, achievements? Uh, was there difficulty? Uh, was there great wealth? Uh, was there poverty? Was there disease? This part of our family history is so important, especially for our children. They need to understand that they are not just by themselves and they come from nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through Allah's wisdom and decree, every human being comes from another human being all the way until uh, Sayyid Hawa and Sayyid Adam alayhim as -salam. And so the more we know about this tree, this family history, uh, this connection, then we are better human beings and we can relate to our family and we can get the lessons and learn and appreciate. So one of the most important concepts in the Quran is appreciation. We have to appreciate how we got here and what so many people went through in order for us to be uh, on this earth, to have this amazing gift, uh, this uh, incredible uh, and huge uh, <coughs> uh, and uh, uh, important miracle, our existence on earth. Uh, there is a verse in the Quran that says, wasn't there a time uh, in history when you were nothing, right? For most of the history of the universe, billions and billions of years, we didn't exist. It wasn't until when we were born that Allah decided that we are to be here. So imagine everything around you that existed before you were born, you had nothing to do with. So how are we going to appreciate what came before us and to build upon what happened in our past and to make things better? We have to know, we have to realize those who came before us and what they did, both good things and bad things, so that we can build upon the good things and not repeat the bad things. Build upon what is positive and uh, try to avoid what is negative? One of the issues in uh, modern Western societies is most kids barely know anything about their own parents and where their parents came from and the culture and civilization of their parents, much less their grandparents or great-grandparents. And unfortunately, uh, this ignorance is happening in many Muslim societies where the parents don't teach their children their own history, their own family history their own origins, uh, their own uh, grandparent and great-grandparents' lives. And this is very sad. This is very unfortunate. Once it is gone, then it is impossible or extremely difficult uh, to recover. 
Now, uh, let me also add here that um, in addition to the challenge of teaching our children history, we are facing some big challenges for our children uh, in all kinds of shapes and forms and uh, conditions. So for example, uh, and here I will mention three uh, challenges that every parent faces today. Number one, because of the uh, internet and technology, for the first time in human history, our children know more than us, know more than their parents. The child has access to more knowledge and more information than their own parents. So all the human generations, the billions of humans that came before us, the parents know more than the children. And the parents would teach the children how to live their life and be successful and get the trade and have a profession and get a halal income, a halal rizq, uh, proper behavior. So everything in the past, the parents would have to teach the children because the children were ignorant and the parents were knowledgeable. Uh, the parents were more knowledgeable, were more experienced, more uh, had more information, uh, had more data. Uh, Brother Sanjar, also you're mentioning, also have access to different perspectives about everything. Yes, exactly. So the child was inside the home and knew very little about what is outside the home. And since the parents were outside the home much more than the child, then they would share with the child. But because of things like the smartphone okay and access to the internet through uh, laptops and ipads and computers uh, and uh, the uh, satellite channels and other sources of knowledge there is such a huge massive amount of knowledge available today that the child can find the answer to a question uh, that their parent never knew about or hadn't been taught or didn't have access to uh, in their generation so for the first time in human history, children know more than their parents. And this has a lot of effects, which we will discuss on parenting, on respect, on the relationship between parents and children. So this is number one, a, a new uh, historic uh, event. Number two, today, for the first time in human history, children can make friends without ever meeting that friend face to face. If you look at Facebook, if you look at Instagram, if you look at Twitter, if you look at Snapchat, uh, if you uh, look at these, what are called social media, our children can speak and hear uh, and uh, see other people which they can become friends with and they never meet face to face. And it could be somebody far away, it could be some physically nearby. But making friends without, without ever meeting that person face to face, this is something that never happened in history. It was impossible in, in the past to, to do this, to have this, uh, at least at this level. So now our children are in a situation where the whole idea of friendship, of peer group, uh, of who they connect to is, is very different than our generation and all the generations in the past. So that's challenge number two. Challenge number three, and it's in some ways the worst challenge, our children will inherit uh, an earth or very likely our grandchildren will inherit an earth that is destroyed, that they can no longer live on, that is uninhabitable, that is so polluted uh, that is uh, so damaged, that is so horrible, that human life will not be possible. If we keep doing what we are doing today, destroying our forests, killing the animals, messing up the environment, uh, throwing garbage in our uh, rivers and lakes and oceans, we keep doing what we are doing today, there will be no possibility for human life in one or two or three more generations. We cannot survive without clean water. We cannot survive without the whole uh, ecology. We cannot survive without animals and plants uh, and clean air. Uh, 
uh, and good soil? We cannot. It's not possible. Our food comes from the soil. If the soil is full of pesticides and herbicides uh, and chemical fertilizer, then it's gone. It's destroyed. And we cannot create soil. We cannot create healthy soil. This happens over billions of years, according to uh, the uh, laws of nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put on this earth. So if we are going to continue destroying the earth like we are today, for the first time in human history, our children, our grandchildren will inherit a destroyed earth. This has never happened in human history. There has been a lot of destruction of the environment in human history, but never at this scale and this level. And some people will justify it and say, well, it will, it's making modern society possible and high technology possible uh, and all kinds of convenient things possible. And to a large extent that is true, but at what cost? If, if the cost is no more human life, how can we justify that? How can we stand in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment and say, we ruined the water and the air uh, and the environment for our children uh, just so that we have uh, uh, more convenience and, and more uh, fun in our life. Yes, Sanja. Uh, can I something add to your uh, uh, let's say the uh, thoughts? Uh, I have to uh, add to something. First of all, it's the uh, you know the authority of parents is declining in in front of their uh, children, and uh, this is not about only about the parents, but about the role model. You know, uh, in the. 20 years or 30 years ago, I think the uh, parents were the best role model models for their children. And uh, when the children grown up, the Prophet and Salaf Salihin were the best role models for the mature men and women. But nowadays, these uh, role models are very uh, declined or distracted because of the globalization, because of uh, the culture as a destructive cultural influence. Uh, this is the uh, first point. Second point is, uh, you know, we are living in a post-normal times, you know, this is the concept of Zod de Sardar. If you know uh, about this concept, uh, or as uh, today children live uh, are living in in a very different uh, world uh, than their uh, parents because everything today is unusual uh, or uh, or extraordinary for their parents but the children is unusual because they are living this life and uh, this is why uh, because this issue very important when we talk about the family, uh, the parenting, and upbringing the children, because everything is not uh, as we want as a parent, and everything is not uh, good as a child, because we uh, try to uh, uh, insert different values, different tradition, different uh, pers uh, the knowledge or something like this, uh, rulers, but our the children nowadays want another things, more freedom, more, how to say, to take uh, enjoy, full enjoyment from the life, because the traditions about more restrictions. Uh, no, uh, the modern life is about more uh, freedom, enjoyment. Uh, taking pleasure uh, from this life. This is a very different, and we need, I think we, we should discuss the new paradigms of uh, about the, uh, the parenting and upbringing of children. And uh, I think we should uh, 
think about the transformation of Islamic paradigms or Islamic ways of uh, uh, understanding family, understanding the parent-child relationships, and also uh, the methods of uh, parenting, uh, uh, upbringing of children. Inshallah, we will discuss this next uh, classes and find solutions and the challenges and the Islamic world, Islamic communities facing not in in the Arabic countries, in Muslim countries, but in USA. I know this, uh, you know, uh, uh, last week, I think uh, the uh, Muslims and Christians protest, protested against the law in Ottawa, in Canada, against the police about the teaching LGBT classes in schools. It's a very big issue for our Islamic uh, communities, not in the West, but in 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 islamic countries also because children are uh, taking knowledge about these things from internet there are many <laughs> information on the internet without filtration filter i uh, would say without filter or uh, uh, okay right. we should uh, teach our ch children when they uh, using internet and differ the bad news and good news which is uh, harmful which is useful unless we cannot uh, uh, bring our children properly thank you very much thank you sanjar may allah bless you for those uh, thoughts uh, and uh, how about you so that uh, what uh, what comments do you think you have on these, uh, on some challenges of uh, children today? Now, children nowadays are learning in different ways. No, like before, children do learn from their parents at home, but nowadays, because of the technology, they are learning so many things through technology. For, in, for instance, internet now, social media, and so on. In fact, we believe that in my community, in my area, let me use that word, children of age seven can handle so many things in computer. Uh, so all these things, it happens and it's telling them more about history itself compared to what they can hear from their parents at school. And it has negative and uh, positive side in, in their life. So it means in another angle, parents need to be watchful and to monitor their parents as, and to their children, especially when they are using internet, because they are learning so many things that's against their religion. For, for example, in, in a lot of things that Islam uh, condemns for us, they can learn it easily through the uh, social media and so on. So those are the things I can say for now. Thank you, Sodat. May Allah bless you. Um, and I am uh, very uh, happy to uh, hear from uh, from both of you uh, and hopefully from other students about uh, the challenges that are uh, being faced. And um, I think one of the key things, uh, especially in this kind of class, in this kind of class, is uh, we want to discuss the challenges, but ultimately, we want to get to solutions. Uh, as although discussing the challenges is important uh, and necessary, but it's not sufficient. Uh, what we really want, uh, in order to get uh, itqan and ihsan, uh, improvement and excellence, is to find a variety of solutions that will help us navigate all these difficulties in our lives, especially uh, those that relate to uh, the family, to the institution of the family. 
Uh, we call the family an institution. What do we mean by institution? We mean a group of people uh, that have a structure and a history. What does that mean? It means human beings that have a certain set of relationships with each other. So that's structure. And then that uh, set of relationships has been around for a long time. So the idea of the family has been around for since the beginning of humanity, but there has been transformation and change, uh, and the relationships may have uh, differed and uh, gone through different stages, but ultimately it's an institution, meaning there are relationships, there's a structure, uh, and those are uh, more or less definable, uh, and uh, there is a progression throughout history that leads us to the family institution uh, that we have today. But this institution is uh, being challenged or even threatened or under attack or uh, other alternatives are being proposed. And so what is called the traditional family, uh, mother, father, children, uh, and then you have the in-laws, uh, the grandparents, the uncles and aunts and cousins. So the nuclear family and then the extended family. Now uh, there is more and more, uh, 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 there, there are more and more attempts and approaches to have alternatives. So a mother and a mother with a child or a father and a father uh, with a child, blended families, uh, single parenthood is increasing uh, throughout the world, uh, and also <clears throat> the issue of uh, being raised by machines or being raised by the government or, or being raised in an orphanage, uh, which has been going on uh, throughout history, uh, but with uh, the uh, wars and the uh, refugee crisis uh, and with the uh, environmental uh, destruction taking place, we see more and more uh, situations where uh, children uh, are away from their parents or their parents have passed away or uh, there is a barrier uh, between uh, children and having uh, a biological two-parent household uh, that is raising them. Uh, and this is a matter of, or should be a matter of great concern to everybody, uh, but particularly to sociologists who focus uh, on the family uh, and there is a need to uh, accommodate and find uh, realistic solutions uh, to these uh, varieties of challenges. So inshallah, we will have more discussions about this uh, in uh, the classes to come. And I'd like you and all the students to come to class with questions and concerns and comments and thoughts uh, and things that they have heard about in the news or they have experienced that they would like to share uh, and like to uh, comment on or uh, receive uh, feedback on uh, related uh, particularly to uh, Islam and uh, the family. I want to also mention uh, the books for this class. We have one primary book, which is called Parent-Child Relations. Uh, this book was actually uh, written by uh, the late uh, al Dr. Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman, uh, and the uh, second author is uh, my father, uh, Dr. Hisham al-Talib. Uh, and the third author is myself, Omar al-Talib. So all three of us, we wrote this book on parenting uh, in Muslim families, uh, which is called Parent-Child Relations. And I will make it available in the Telegram group so you can download the uh, copy for free. Uh, or for those of you who want to buy a copy, it is uh, available on... Uh, Amazon and uh, some other uh, bookstores uh, and we will not read the whole book we will only look at uh, certain uh, sections of the book uh, but the hope is that we can understand uh, what makes a family more capable of uh, being successful and dealing with the challenges today and then finding uh, various solutions uh, to uh, what is uh, happening and what is destroying uh, families throughout the world. Uh, I'll give an example here. So we make a suggestion in the book uh, that uh, <clears throat> there should be uh, support for early marriage. 
uh, for example, uh, after the age of 18, uh, young Muslim women and young Muslim men, uh, especially those who are similar in age, <coughs> should be supported and encouraged by their parents to get married and to get married early, even if uh, they uh, may still not yet have finished education or gotten a job. Now, this is a controversial suggestion. Not everybody agrees with it. Uh, not everybody follows it. Uh, but we feel that the uh, advantages are greater than the disadvantages. Because no matter when you get married, there will be advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so we discuss those, and we will discuss them in uh, our class here at IKI. Uh, and there is no uh, right or wrong answer. This is only uh, a proposed solution that we have provided. It's not a new solution. It's been done throughout history, uh, but uh, it is something we feel uh, is very critical for our children uh, uh, in uh, today's modern society. Uh, another thing uh, is that uh, as you will uh, go through life and you've already uh, done a lot of studying, a lot of times uh, professors or courses are frustrating because in the sense that you go through and you study for many months and you do a lot of reading and work and in the end uh, after the class is over, somebody asks you or you ask yourself, uh, so what is the result? What, uh, what has been achieved? And sometimes it has been helpful and useful, but for a lot of courses, the answer is, well, uh, I, don't, I can't really say uh, how this course has made my life better or uh, changed me in a positive way or prevented me from uh, doing something that is problematic. So in my opinion, especially in the social sciences, unless the course is going to transform your life for the better, uh, then we have to rethink why a person is taking the course or why it's being offered uh, in the first place. Uh, and I feel, and I do not speak for all the professors here, but I feel the job of the professor is not just to give you knowledge, but to give you or to help you uh, look at various solutions. There is no one solution to any big problem uh, there is no uh, perfect solution, but at least there has to be some discussion of uh, resolving the issues. Because if you just raise the problem uh, and just talk about the problem and go around the problem uh, and point out the existence of the problem, uh, which is necessary, but if that's all you do, then uh, that can lead to a lot of uh, frustration and uh, a lot of feeling uh, incomplete. And I see this, uh, I've attended thousands of uh, Friday khutbahs, uh, of Friday sermons in uh, masjids throughout the world. Uh, and you go and you listen to the khatib and you pay attention to their, to their sermon, to their khutbah, and then you leave the masjid and you don't feel uh, any different, any more enlightened, any uh, thing that's particularly helpful to your life. I'm not saying what they're saying is wrong. They may be emphasizing something uh, important or uh, correct or useful, but uh, there's not much thought by uh, many of the uh, imams to giving you not just the problem, but the solution or some su suggestion for solutions or how to get a solution uh, to a problem. Uh, and this is emotionally draining when there's no solution and just talking about the problem and could lead to uh, various uh, types of uh, <clears throat> getting upset, getting sad, uh, getting emotional, uh, getting into arguments. And that is not really uh, what we want to have as our goal or the ultimate uh, achievement. And I'm not saying every imam is, gives bad khutbahs. There are a lot of imams that give uh, good khutbahs. But a good khutbah is not enough. We need uh, solution-oriented uh, khutbahs, in my humble uh, opinion. And we need more people in the Muslim community, women and men, to uh, teach our children to demand and to request uh, and to uh, expect uh, a khutbah that is good. And if it's a classroom, a classroom session that is uh, powerful and empowering uh, and leading to uh, better behavior and uh, good solutions to issues uh, that people face. 
Uh, and one of these areas is entertainment. Uh, Muslims, in my humble opinion, or in my own limited experience, rarely uh, have thoughtful discussions about entertainment. Every human being, based upon the uh, way our uh, Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has made us, we need entertainment. We need serious things in our life, like the uh, ritual prayers, like the uh, dua, uh, like uh, the uh, efforts to uh, raise a good family. These are all important. Uh, but also, uh, we uh, have issues uh, that deal with uh, making ourselves uh, happier and uh, reduce our anxiety, uh, reduce our depression, reduce our uh, feelings of uh, uh, being uh, sad. And how do we do that? And one way to do that is through healthy entertainment. There's all kinds of entertainment. Unfortunately, there's some very bad entertainment, but we want to focus and to teach our kids about good entertainment. So every society has different ways to uh, do entertainment. It can be through sports, it can be through games, uh, it can be through competitions, uh, it can be through uh, different types of media like movies, uh, like TV shows, like uh, theater, uh, like uh, visiting uh, an art museum, uh, like walking in the garden, going to the park. I mean, our Creator has given us a wide variety of ways to lift our spirit and to have uh, entertainment in a halal way. Uh, but a lot of our kids may end up just spending all their time uh, playing games on the phone or on the computer or just uh, staying in the room, uh, wasting time or uh, being bored. Uh, and this notion of, of being bored, of being unsatisfied, is a very modern thing. Uh, children in the past, uh, and you may know this from your old childhood or your parents' and grandparents' childhood, no matter what uh, was uh, around them, they would find a way to uh, play, to have fun, even if they were very poor, even if they didn't have toys, but they found ways to have fun, especially with other children. Now when a child wants to be alone and... Uh, doesn't care about the toys that they have been given and uh, is uh, they have a low, short attention span, then they get bored and they become frustrated. And they may end up doing uh, haram things or negative things or bad things to themselves, even including uh, thoughts about uh, I mean, getting into this issue of loneliness or even worse, into thoughts about suicide. So this is a serious issue in the non-Muslim community, but also in the Muslim community, uh, and we, we, our job as parents, it's our responsibility to see to it that a child's life is as fulfilled as possible and least likely to end to tragedy and uh, destructive behavior uh, and doing bad things and hurting themselves or hurting others. Uh, so, for example, our relationship with animals. On the one hand, there is an attitude of love and caring and respect uh, and support for animals. On the other hand, uh, there is an attitude of hatred toward animals and dislike. Uh, and uh, uh, but uh, <clears throat> even uh, doing uh, hurtful things to animals uh, and uh, torturing animals or uh, even killing animals uh, through no fault of their own. So we need to find a healthy balance. Children, our children, need to understand that animals are a creation of our creator. They were not created in vain, purposeless, without reason. There is a reason for every creation that uh, is created by uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by our, our creator, including and especially animals. Now, there are rules that Allah has given us. Uh, which animals we eat, which animals we don't eat, uh, which animals uh, we uh, are uh, going to uh, uh, try to uh, establish as household pets, uh, and which animals we have to respect, uh, that they are wild animals and need to be uh, encouraged and uh, allowed to grow 
uh, in their wild habitats. So all these have to do with uh, nature and proper uh, <coughs> relationships with uh, our uh, animal uh, kingdom and our plant kingdom. Uh, but children have to be taught this. Uh, and if we just uh, let it uh, be unsaid, and then they may or may not learn uh, negative or, or uh, problematic uh, ideas from their friends, from their neighborhood, uh, even from their school, uh, or from television, or from other sources. Uh, even within the Islamic tradition, there is a variety, there are a variety of opinions. Uh, let's take, for example, the issue of uh, dogs. Uh, some Muslims have adopted the idea that they are impure and filthy, uh, and it's haram to own a dog or to have a dog as a pet, and we should stay away from dogs, uh, uh, and even to the extent of uh, looking down on dogs and considering them uh, just like a, a pest or a nuisance or uh, something to avoid. Whereas, uh, again, this is my own personal opinion, when we look at the Islamic tradition, when we look at the Quran, uh, and the way the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, behaved, and the way uh, Islamic civilization developed, dogs are mentioned in the Quran. They are given a high level of respect in the Quran. Uh, we are taught in the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that we live among dogs, we respect dogs, they are our pets, they are inside our house, they are outside our house. Uh, they are uh, very noble and uh, very uh, amazing creatures uh, created by Allah to serve uh, women and men in, in this life. Now, of course, you have to train them properly. You have to give them uh, proper direction. Uh, you have to show leadership to a dog. That is absolutely necessary. Uh, but to say they are haram, this is completely against Islam. Uh, to say that you cannot own a dog, this is completely against Islam. Uh, the Prophet, uh, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to own dogs used to live together in the same houses. Uh, the, uh, in fact, uh, if you refuse uh, to uh, feed a dog or give uh, water to a dog that is thirsty or that is starving, this can be a reason for entering into uh, Jahannam, into hell. Uh, billah, so so uh, not only are dogs respected and important in the Islamic tradition, we have to serve dogs in case they are in need. Uh, among other things. So we are a tradition that respects dogs as opposed to uh, avoiding them. Uh, today we have been affected by uh, old, uh, some old Christian traditions and some uh, negative attitudes of the extremists uh, and the uh, uh, close-minded, uh, some close-minded uh, people uh, that we have gotten this idea of hating dogs and avoiding dogs. Uh, and being against dogs. In my opinion, that is the wrong uh, approach. So we have to teach our children uh, what is the right approach and how to behave uh, properly. Furthermore, we need to be aware of the uh, challenges that children face, especially in the government schools. One of the worst things to do today Unfortunately, and I say this based upon experience and knowledge and studies and research, one of the worst things that any human parent can do today is send their child to a government school. And this is true everywhere in the world, in the West, in the East, in the rich countries, in the poor countries, uh, in the advanced countries, in the developed countries, anywhere you go in the world, the government school system is a disaster. Maybe there are some very, very, very small exceptions. But Muslim children and non-Muslim children, yes, thank you, Sanja, are being sent to government schools. Most children are sent to government schools, Muslim children and non-Muslim children. And this is leading to tragedy. This is a huge problem. Government schools today are doing what to our children? They are providing them with a negative environment, both socially and academically. Uh, most government schools don't care about uh, our Creator, about the Quran, about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or even worse, they 
show the children that religion is not important or less important or uh, something not worthy of discussion. So when a school does not include any religion at all, whether Islam or any other religion, in any subject, in any topic, uh, throughout uh, 12 years of school, so this sends the message indirectly to the child that religion is not important. And this is a tragedy. So when a child is taught that uh, biology is important, that mathematics is important, that language is important, but then by omission, that religion is not important, this is horrible. What is the point of your child becoming the greatest medical doctor, the greatest lawyer, uh, the greatest uh, football player, but they don't believe in Allah or their religion is very weak or their faith is uh, easily uh, manipulated? How is that a good thing? They, uh, I mean, the Quran and the Prophet, peace be upon him, talk about buying uh, this life with the life of the hereafter. In other words, having all the physical nice things in this life, but having nothing for the hereafter. How is that a good thing? We're not saying that this life should be avoided. No, we want success in this life, but we want success in the hereafter. We don't want the contradiction. We want one to support the other. Government schools don't do that, or they're terrible at doing that. So even when you have a subject inside the school about Islam or Islamic history or the Quran, even if there is a subject, that still does not solve the problem. Because what it does, it, it compartment, compartmentalizes faith. It makes it into just one of many different uh, arenas and topics. And a lot of times it doesn't count toward the final exam or the national exam, uh, which reduces its importance. Or the teachers who teach it are not the best teachers. Or even when good teachers may teach it, it's still considered as just one of many subjects unrelated to the other subjects. We are required as parents in Islamic civilization to teach our children how Islamic civilization is comprehensive, how Islamic civilization supports mathematics, supports uh, chemistry, uh, supports uh, spirituality, supports the masjid, supports the family, it's comprehensive. And yet in, in school, it is not taught in a comprehensive way. So when the teacher is talking about physics, it has nothing to do with uh, anything in our religion. And when the teacher talks about, uh, for example, hadith, if there is a topic taught in school about hadith, it is not related very well to uh, the other topics in class, whether it is politics or civics uh, or uh, language. And so this kind of split, which was done uh, during the colonial period in the Muslim world, is horrible for the children. It creates a uh, schizophrenia. It creates a, a split personality uh, or a, a dichotomy in their mind between what is religious and what is uh, otherwise. Uh, and so uh, this leads our children to be uh, either misunderstanding of their faith or not recognizing its importance or unable to face the challenges. So when the extremists, when the terrorists, when the uh, people who are preaching things that are problematic, uh, they come and they try to recruit our children, our children don't have the tools to confront them uh, and to say to their face, you are wrong. I know the Islamic tradition, you claim you know the Islamic tradition, but your understanding is mistaken or wrong or misplaced or incorrect. That's what we need uh, with our children to be able to understand human sciences, modern sciences, and the Islamic tradition all together comprehensively so that they can face the physical challenges, the social challenges, the spiritual challenges, and they know how to confront the extremists or anybody who is making these uh, crazy uh, accusations or outrageous accusations about Islam that are not true. Whether it is uh, overly uh, <coughs> conservative uh, types of claims like uh, uh, dancing is haram in Islam, or the total opposite, that uh, you can do anything you want in life, Islam is not important. Uh, whether you want to call that the libertine or the uh, 
a completely hedonistic perspective. Just go have fun uh, and uh, don't worry about uh, Islam, don't worry about religion. All these, both of these extremes are uh, not acceptable for uh, a Muslim upbringing or uh, a proper and successful uh, future for our children. And yet, this is what our schools are promoting. Almost every school is uh, doing this, whether intentionally or unintentionally. We're not talking about intentions here. We're talking about the results. Uh, and the results of our schools, our government schools, are <coughs> uh, improperly teaching about uh, faith and religion and Islam. Uh, our government schools are uh, boring. Our government schools are, in many ways, a waste of time. Uh, teaching things that children already know uh, or that uh, they uh, have learned before or uh, that uh, are not taught in a creative way. And just the whole idea of forcing a child to sit from morning till afternoon in a seat, not moving, just paying attention to the teacher, this is very artificial. This is not how uh, our creator created our bodies. We were created, especially when we are children, to be constantly moving, interacting with nature, uh, smelling different smells, seeing different things, hearing different sounds, uh, interacting with animals and with plants and with uh, water and with air, with mountains, with uh, valleys. Uh, this is how our body was created, to connect with the environment. When we force our children especially most of them against their will, to sit in a classroom, whether it's on the floor or on the desk, and to force themselves to be uh, not moving and to just pay attention to the teacher for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, one hour, class after class, even though some are learning, but it's a very artificial learning environment. It is not good. It is not good for our body. It's not good for our brain. It's not good for our soul and spirit so even when the content is good uh it's still a bad way of teaching like television even when the content of the television is good it's not a good way of learning if you want to learn from the quran you should read the quran get the quran teacher that is a million times better than uh, just uh, seeing the quran on tv that aspect of interaction is extremely important for human beings and this is why in sociology we emphasize so much uh, the interaction. So with your kids, it is so important to have that interaction as much as possible. You don't have to be talking to each other. Even if it is just uh, watching your children play uh, and making a comment or uh, adding another piece to their puzzle uh, or uh, uh, making them smile, uh, giving them a joke, all these, even though they may be simple interactions, but they are very important interactions that we may not recognize how important uh, they are in our children's lives. And then when they grow up and they become teenagers and then they don't want anything to do with us and then we scratch our heads and say, well, why don't our kids want to talk with us, eat with us, play with us, go places with us? This is a reflection of what had taken place earlier on when they were young and they wanted their atten your attention, they needed your, their, your attention, they required your attention, and maybe depending on your circumstances or other reasons, we were not able to uh, give them uh, as much attention as we could. could. Uh, and that's why we need to take them outside, help them play with other children, especially outside, run and skip and jump in the environment in the forest, with the trees, uh, with the animals, uh, with the water, uh, instead of teaching our children that, uh, oh, stay away from the mud and the puddles uh, and after the rain or don't get in the rain. In fact, we should help them appreciate the rain. The rain is a good thing. Now, we don't want them to get sick, uh, of course, but at the same time, we want their, get, their bodies to get used to uh, being and interacting in an environment with the rain. The rain is a blessing from Allah. Of course, we don't want the lightning, so we keep them away from the lightning. But even when there is lightning, we should not teach them to be scared of lightning, right? Allah is not creating the lightning to uh, make us afraid uh, and to uh, make us scared. 
the lightning is one of the blessings of Allah. So we let the child see the lightning from far away, do the proper safety measures uh, by staying away from uh, anything that would uh, cause uh, the lightning to hurt us. But we teach our children to appreciate lightning rather than to be afraid of lightning. And we say encouraging things to our children uh, about how the clouds come together and this leads to rain and lightning and thunder and all this is a blessing from Allah. We have to respect that blessing from Allah, but we only fear Allah by understanding that we should never go against the will of Allah. We should love Allah. We should uh, bring ourselves and our children closer to Allah. And we fear disobeying Allah. That is the only thing we should fear. We should fear going against the laws and rules uh, and the judgments uh, of Allah. That's only. Nothing here on this earth we should be afraid of. We should be careful. We should be wise. Uh, we should be respectful, but not afraid. Whether it is a dog, whether it is lightning, whether it is flooding, we should do what is correct but not out of fear. Rather, we do it out of respect and wisdom and understanding and knowledge. Okay, we have a few minutes left. Uh, anybody uh, has any uh, final things, comments, uh, ideas you would like to share? Okay, while you're thinking, I will uh, mention here that uh, I do teach other classes. Uh, so I am teaching uh, the uh, Islam and Family Institution class, this class, ITKI 6203. I'm also teaching ITKI 6204, which is Sociology of Religion and Culture. So this course on the family and the sociology of religion uh, and culture course are the elective courses, uh, two of the elective courses offered by IKI Academy. And then I'm also teaching uh, the uh, required course uh, called uh, Ijtihad, Renewal and Modernity in Contemporary Islamic Thought. So those of you who have registered for those courses, that's wonderful. Uh, uh, I um, am uh, honored and uh, happy to be uh, your teacher in those classes, and as much as possible, we will try to relate the courses uh, to uh, each other. So for example, when we uh, talk about uh, Ijtihad, Renewal, and Modernity, uh, there's a lot of things that affect the family. A lot of things that the scholars tell us are right or wrong that ends up affected how we behave as a family. And this includes who we choose as a marriage partner, our weddings are affected a lot uh, by uh, what we are told is right and wrong, uh, how we raise our kids, uh, and what we teach our kids. So we are supposed to teach our kids right and wrong, but how do we know what is right and what is wrong? A lot of times we depend on our scholars, and our scholars uh, are part of the uh, tradition of ijtihad, renewal, and uh, modernity. Uh, in uh, our uh, societies and our cultures and our civilization. Uh, and then in terms of sociology of religion and culture, uh, religion and culture have a very strong relationship to the family, and the family has a very strong relationship to religion and culture. So you can have religion and culture affecting the family, and you can have the family affecting uh, religion and culture. So, for example, uh, in uh, some uh, religions, uh, who you marry is determined by your religion. So there is a tradition in Islam uh, that is a, a Muslim man can marry a non-Muslim uh, woman uh, if she's a Christian or a Jew. And then uh, a Muslim woman is not allowed to marry uh, a non-Muslim man, uh, whether Christian or Jew or otherwise. Now, is this tradition still valid? Is it uh, part of uh, a continuous thread in Islamic civilization that we should pass on to our children? Or is it something that uh, should be uh, rethought 
uh, and not considered a prohibition, uh, but rather a choice. Each side has uh, arguments for and against uh, so that you cannot hear. Uh, I'm very sorry that uh, there are problems with the uh, internet connections uh, and hopefully, inshallah, uh, we will try to address those uh, as we go along. Uh, and uh, hopefully the recording will be able to solve uh, some of the issues that we face uh, with uh, the connection. Uh, and so uh, my apologies uh, in case anything is not clear uh, or hard to hear. Uh, another issue that we uh, look at in sociology of religion and culture that uh, affects the family is uh, everything we wear, we eat, uh, our habits when greeting other people, uh, our entertainment, all that is affected by our culture. Uh, whether it is a Muslim culture or a non-Muslim culture, uh, it is going to have an effect uh, on us, uh, on our families, uh, on what we do. Uh, and we may like it, we may not like it, uh, but uh, that is where we get into discussions and uh, into exchanges uh, into arguments about uh, when uh, and how uh, and why we should be following something that is cultural uh, and when we should not, uh, especially when there is a conflict between religion and culture. So, for example, uh, in uh, my own culture, original culture from Mosul in Iraq, uh, only uh, people from Mosul are, are allowed to marry uh, your son and daughter from Mosul. So if a, a man or a woman who's from a, a Muslim family, uh, they are told by their parents and relatives they need to find a wife or a husband from another Muslim family. Uh, now there are exceptions, but essentially that is the culture. That is the tradition. Now, what does Islam say? Well, uh, uh, from my perspective, from my understanding of Islam, Islam says you marry any from anywhere in the world as long as they are practicing Muslim. Yes, Sanjo. Uh, we have as a, such a uh, tradition in Central Asia, especially in Uzbekistan. There's a Sayyid, same as Sayyid, I don't know. Was, yeah, we call uh, Isha. Uh, they only uh, use to marry from this type of person, person, person uh, uh, tribe. I, this, uh, we have uh, such a thing. Exactly. So this is, this is common. It's a common practice, but it's not Islamic from the understanding of the scholars we are teaching. It's part of the culture, and it contradicts Islam uh, and puts restrictions that Islam did not put. So it is making something uh, that is halal into something that is haram, meaning marrying people from other cultures, from other parts of the world, from other tribes, from other regions. Now, of course, there are reasons for it, and there are advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but just because it's part of the culture doesn't make it halal, and just because it is part of the culture doesn't make it haram. So here, inshallah, we will end our uh, course, our class number one. Uh, I really want to thank the both of you for attending and listening and participating. Uh, and may Allah bless you. Uh, and inshallah, until we meet again, uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Walaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Jazakum Thank you.